Welcome to Queer by the Beach, the history of the Fort Lauderdale LGBT community. For those of you familiar with the history of South Florida, you know prior to the 20th century, this area was a very thinly populated land of mangrove swamps, pine forests, and a long sandy coastal beach. The South Florida we know today was a creation of Henry Flagler, the Standard Oil tycoon who built the Florida East Coast Railroad in the late 1890s. This connected Florida with the whole East Coast. Flagler built grand tourist hotels in Palm Beach and Miami. If you look at this early map of the East Coast Railroad and the railroad schedule, you note the fact that Fort Lauderdale is not a very prominent part of that picture. In many ways, Fort Lauderdale is stuck between Miami and Palm Beach. And in many ways, that's the story about early Fort Lauderdale. We were just a stop on the railroad from Palm Beach to Miami. This area was a very important agricultural area for growing winter vegetables, tomatoes, and green beans. As you can see from these pictures, the farms were very large. Looking at this photo, if I were to guess we went out to the same spot today, we would see houses going on forever and ever. Another important factor about early Fort Lauderdale history is that many of the people who lived here were black. They were from North Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and were farm workers. Although many of them were seasonal, many of them also moved here. You begin to see the emergence of a black community very, very early in the history of Fort Lauderdale. In the early 1920s, Dixie Highway and US-1 were built to connect South Florida with the rest of the nation. Prior to the 1920s, tourists came here by train. Mostly of them were rich and went to Miami or Palm Beach. But early in the 1920s, you had the explosive growth of the automobile culture that was fueled by Henry Ford's Model T. These cars were inexpensive and provided the means by which America's growing middle class could also become tourists. They drove down here in their Model T cars, popularly called tin cans. Many parked the car alongside the road in Fort Lauderdale, set up a tent, and stayed here for weeks, creating what was then called tin can tourist camps. Fort Lauderdale, compared to Miami and Palm Beach, was a popular destination for many ordinary people from the north, seeking the balm of warm winter weather. In 1926, a major hurricane hit South Florida. It did a great deal of damage to the area. Following the hurricane, unfortunately, was the Depression, which wrecked many people's lives. In the early 1940s, with the advent of World War II, South Florida became a very important part of training military people for the war. In Fort Lauderdale, you had the development of a Navy station. You also had the construction of a ma major air station. Along with this, you had the development of infrastructure, that is roads, communication, and housing for the military personnel. This greatly energized the area. One of the big stories of South Florida is a tremendous population growth that had occurred over these years. In 1905, Broward County was actually part of Dade County, and thus is not on the table. But by 1915, it became a county, but it only had 4,000 people. It was the third least populated county in South Florida. However, in the years 1920 to 1945, you had tremendous growth. Broward grew over 900% to a population of 50,000. Now, 50,000 people, by today's standards, isn't very much. But nonetheless, this sort of shows that population growth was an important aspect of life down here. It offered both many opportunities, but also put pressure on all kinds of civic services, such as police, health services, fire, and so on. 
There was thus a constant churn in this area. By the 1940s, Fort Lauderdale had developed into a medium city with hotels, businesses, and neighborhoods. Down the road you had Miami, and of course Miami was the star of the universe in South Florida. Up until the 1970s, Fort Lauderdale lived in the shadow of the much larger Miami, which had a far more prominent national profile. Much of the advertising and media depictions of South Florida focused on Miami. I'd like to take a moment and talk about Miami, particularly how queerness was a part of the city from the beginning. One of the first large buildings created in Miami around 1910 was Vizcaya. It had gardens and very elegant interiors. You might even want to say it had a kind of queer environment. It was built by the wealthy northern industrialist James Deering, a lifelong bachelor from Chicago. Paul Chaflin, the designer, helped build the interior. He also was a lifelong bachelor. Deering invited one of his friends, the artist John Singer Sargent, to come down and visit Vizcaya. Sargent was very impressed with Vizcaya. He painted a number of watercolors of the buildings and gardens. He also painted a number of pictures of the Bahamian workers who helped build Vizcaya. Suffice to say, Sargent was also a bachelor. If you want to know more about the early queer history of Miami, I recommend the book Welcome to Fairyland by Julio Capo. It is a story about queer Miami before the 1940s. Miami by the late 1930s was a growing, bustling city with a large modern downtown particularly during the winter season. It had a very active nightlife modeled after New York City, home to many of the tourists. As this newspaper column noted, Miami was Broadway with the Palms. A key part of that nightlife scene were the bars and dinner clubs. Many of them had live entertainment and female impersonators as dancers or singers. You also had them in Miami. As you can see from these club ads printed in the Miami newspapers, they were described as bohemian and spicy. The word gay is used in these ads to denote sophisticated and risque entertainment that was popular with the young, sophisticated New Yorkers. However, for the many homosexuals who at this point were still barely visible, it designated a space where sexual and gender boundaries were blurred or queer. Often both the entertainers and the staff were female impersonators. Here homosexuals could meet other highly closeted homosexuals like themselves. A very prominent and popular pansy bar was Club Ha Ha. It originally started in New York as a musical review featuring female impersonators. It opened in Hollywood as a club in January 1935. It was the first gay bar in Broward. At this time, Hollywood and Hollandale were part of the Miami nightlife and entertainment orbit. Hollywood opened a dog racing track which was popular with the tourists. Club Haha -Ha opened across the street from the track. Prominently featured at the club were two popular female impersonators, Jackie Maine and Johnny Magnum. They were prominent figures in the history of female impersonation. As you can see, they present themselves as very elegantly feminine. I'd like to take a moment to talk about female impersonation. When we talk about female impersonators today, we typically think of drag queens. But female impersonators have a long and distinguished history of theatrical performance going back to the 17th century. It was seen as a very professional career and activity. 
Basically, the people who performed as female impersonators were very talented and took impersonation very seriously. It's useful to think about female impersonators on a continuum, with the sophisticated, elegant, feminine impersonators like Jackie Mae on one end, and the far more raunchy, explicit, highly sexually transgressive drag queens of today on the other end. During this period, the early 1940s and in the midst of World War II, a number of military training bases were built in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. These pansy bars were popular with the soldiers and the Navy men, but in 1944 the military barred servicemen from this club, claiming that the place was not suitable for military personnel. Typically the major reason was that too many in the audience were gay soldiers. Alan Baruby's book, Coming Out Under Fire, has an excellent discussion about how the military watched these kind of clubs closely. Also watching Club Haha was Robert Gore, the owner and publisher of the Fort Lauderdale Daily News. For 35 years he was a major power in Broward politics. He didn't like the fact that the club operated in Broward. In a series of front-page editorials, he called for the closing of the club, arguing that, quote, Broward may tolerate gambling, but there should be no place in our social order for lipsticked and rouge-smeared perverts who parade their deprivation before decent men and women, unsuspecting, lured into this den by a glaring neon sign. Gore got Frank Tuppen, the juvenile probation officer from the Broward Sheriff's Office, to go and get an injunction to close this bar, saying that it was a very immoral place and a danger to children. Bay Baker, the owner of the bar, obviously was not happy with this, and he appealed the injunction, and the case went all the way up to the Florida State Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took all the testimony that was given about what was happening in the bar. And it's interesting to note that the major kind of complaint was not that there were female impersonators. In fact, at one point the judge said, female impersonation was a legal, acceptable kind of entertainment. The big problem was the audience. It seemed to be comprised mostly of homosexuals. The judge found the show to be obscene. However, he ruled Baker could continue the shows as long as they were cleaned up. He continued his shows with the female impersonators and with the content a little toned down. But the county deputy complained again, saying Baker was not following the judge's ruling, and the judge found Baker in contempt. He closed the club down, but just moved down to Miami. Still operating in Miami at that time were other pansy bars with female impersonator shows. They loudly advertised themselves as gay, gay, gay. Even the bartenders were part of the entertainment. However, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, these kinds of bars were less and less regarded as places of sophisticated, elegant entertainment, but more and more as expressions of perversion and hangouts for the low element. At that time, the Miami police had a policy of not harassing these bars, saying that, yes, homosexuals gather there, but this was a way of keeping track of them. More importantly, in Miami, but also in Fort Lauderdale, you had a growing, vibrant tourist economy, and you had to be very careful when you began to enforce strict kinds of moral codes. But, in 1954, the Miami Herald, in its role as protector of Miami's image, initiated a month-long campaign against the police's policy of tolerance, arguing that such a policy attracted more homosexuals and that the bars should be shut down. Finally, the police responded and conducted a major series of raids on the bars, which shut them down, but only for a few weeks. Within a month, they were open and running, but without the female impersonation entertainment. In Broward, 
There were alarms that all the homosexuals would move north, and people were alerted. But it turned out to be a false alarm. Indeed, as shown by this photo taken in Hollywood in the 1950s, Broward was still a very popular place for the growing number of self-aware gay men. The 1950s were a very dark period for lesbians and gay men. In 1947, you had the publication of the first volume of research by Alfred Kinsey on American sexual behavior. His research found that one in ten men had a homosexual experience. The 1950s was a decade when American society was beginning to learn that many homosexuals were a part of it. Many cities, becoming aware of the homosexual communities within their borders, established police moral squads to crack down. The 1954 bar raid that happened in Miami was just one example of that. The media was filled with accounts of homosexuality as a disease and as a threat to society. It is not surprising that you don't see a flourishing of gay spaces such as pansy bars that you saw in the 1930s and 1940s. Also in Washington, you had the Lavender Scare, where the government, just like it started a search for communists, began to search for homosexuals in the government. I recommend this great book by David Johnson, The Lavender Scare, which gives an in-depth account of this campaign. Yet this anxiety about sexuality reflected a broader, deeper change that was coming in American society. Both the war and the blossoming post-war consumerist society weakened pre-war notions of sexuality and gender. In 1954, you had the publication of the first issue of Playboy. Another indication of this was the appearance of the Muscle magazine. These magazines depicted well-muscled young men and were sold to men interested in physical fitness and who worked on their bodies through weightlifting. Also, these magazines were very, very popular with homosexual men. In many ways, they were a form of erotica, a gay version of Playboy, and also another sign that despite the crackdown, the homosexual presence was there and growing. There's another very good book called Buying Gay, again by David Johnson, a professor at the University of South Florida. It's about the whole use of these kind of muscle magazines as a way of popularizing these kind of male images and how they helped build the early gay movement. One of the most popular magazines was Strength and Health. In 1954, they featured a cover story on L. Christensen, a Fort Lauderdale resident. He owned a local gym in Wilton Manors, where he trained young men in weightlifting. He also sponsored a weightlifting team for young men. This team often trained on a stretch of beach in Dania, which they call Bosco Beach, after the gym's mascot. He also trained a spearfishing team that won a prize in a Key West spearfishing competition. Now, there is nothing in the media coverage that explicitly says that L. Christensen was a homosexual. L. Christensen was a married man, and he had a number of sons. But you can look at these photos and a person like L. Christensen and read their life in a number of different ways. He was very artistic and enjoyed doing velvet paintings. He later moved to the Bahamas, where he continued his spearfishing and his painting. Back to the magazines. In these magazines, aside from the articles and pictures about bodybuilding, you would find these ads for packages of pictures, young attractive men in various states of undress. Taking photos of naked men and semi-naked men and selling them through the mail was again a popular expression of a gay presence. You can see that a number of these photos were being done in South Florida, often using the Florida beach as a backdrop. Again, this was a fairly early form of erotica that was being produced. It was a very popular business, although you could get arrested for sending obscene material through the mail. Now at this time, another form of media practice, particularly in the local press like the Fort Lauderdale News, 
was to identify local young men and women who seemed to embody many of the characteristics and virtues desirable in American youth. You found this in the reporting of high school sports, civic affairs, and academics. One notable success story was L. Parsons. He was a high school student in Fort Lauderdale. He got a scholarship based on his skills at debate. He also volunteered to work for the Sheriff's Department. He was invited to address the Florida State Legislature about the need to control pornography. Even his birthday was celebrated in the newspaper. However, in the early 1960s, a different story about L. Parsons appeared. He was arrested and charged with taking pictures, some of them nude, of young men on the beach. He would drive along the beach and find these young men and offered them $5 for the picture, $10 if they disrobed it completely. He ended up having quite a collection, and he sold copies of his photos to older men through the mail. He had about 5,000 names on his list. The young boys who posed, and the men whose names were on the list were picked up. Only Parsons stood trial. He was sentenced to two and a half years. At his sentencing, he said to the judge, quote, I lost sight of the principles of life which had been instilled in me since childhood. I feel that as a result of this situation, I have these principles in full view now with a clearer perspective. End of quote. After being released on probation, he was again arrested for taking nude pictures of two boys and also engaging in an unnatural sex act with one of them. But this time the judge found him not guilty. So even though at this time there was not much openly gay lifestyle visible, below the surface, or maybe not so much below, there was a lot of it. The 1960s was a decade that saw major changes, both in South Florida and throughout the nation. In the 1960s, the South Florida population continued to explode. In 1950, Fort Lauderdale and Broward County had 83,000 people. Over the next 20 years, over half a million people moved to Broward, and in 1970, we had 620,000 people. Other Florida counties experienced similar kinds of growth. In order to accommodate this population growth, new cities had to be built. On this map of Broward County in the 1920s, most of the cities, Fort Lauderdale, Davie, Dania, are on the coast, alongside the railroad track. Looking at this map from the 1960s, you see an explosion of cities throughout the county, particularly in the west. All that agricultural land you saw before is now filled with houses. Another big thing happened in 1960 was the premiere of the movie, Where the Boys Are. It was the first big national advertisement for Fort Lauderdale. Up to that time, it was either Miami or Palm Beach that got all the notice. This movie put Fort Lauderdale on the map. It also put Spring Break on the map. You came to Fort Lauderdale, particularly if you were young, to go to the beach and have fun. People came from colleges and universities across the country to come to Spring Break in Fort Lauderdale. It gave the city much needed publicity and also bought in millions of dollars. As people moved here, particularly into the western suburbs, central Fort Lauderdale began to deteriorate. Much of the new construction was happening out west. Many businesses in the downtown area began to close and move out west. The deterioration of the urban central core was also happening across the country, particularly in places like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. With the central cities becoming depopulated, gay men began to move in these areas, buying houses and fixing them up. In time, this created a whole complex cultural system of bars, bathhouses, and other queer spaces. This process of gentrification is an important part of the queer story. During this time in the early 1960s, another important thing was happening. In the 1950s, you had the Lavender Scare, or when the federal government went after homosexuals. You had something similar happening here in Florida and in South Florida. In 1954, the Florida State Legislature created what came to be known as the Johns Committee, named after its chair. 
Initially, they started to investigate suspected communists within the civil rights movement in Florida. However, they didn't get very far, as their efforts were blocked by the court. Instead, they began to focus on the presence of homosexuals, both in universities and also in public schools across the state. Stacy Brockman's book is excellent in terms of examining the work of the committee. Over the eight years of their investigation, they collected a lot of information, and in 1964 they took it all and wrote it up and published it in a report called Homosexuality and Citizenship in Florida. They wanted to educate the people of Florida about the threat of homosexuality. Much as many of the publications issued by the FBI in the 1950s about the threat of communism into America, this report was meant to shock the public, get their attention, educate them, and convince them that this was a serious threat. As part of their report, they printed photos that they had in their files. They also put together a glossary of what they called homosexual terms and deviant acts. Their expectation was that people would read this, see the photos, be shocked, and be mobilized to go after homosexuals. People were shocked, however not by homosexuals, but by the fact the state legislative committee would be using taxpayers' money to print a document that had sexually explicit photos and language. The state's attorney in Dade County declared the book obscene and its distribution in Dade illegal. The book was read, but not by a concerned Florida public, but by gay men, particularly in New York, where many bought it through a gay-owned book service. By 1965, there was a growing reaction against the committee and the publication of the report was the last straw. The committee was seen as going off the rails. In 1965, there was a move to shut the committee down, and the legislature stopped funding it. But still the echoes of what the committee had done existed throughout the state. Here in Broward, the whole impact and work of the Johns Committee was seen as still being very important to life here. Homosexuals were still seen as a big problem. Interestingly enough, the report produced an interesting series of newspaper articles about gay life in the county. The reporter went to and visited a number of suspected gay bars. The resulting articles made the gay bars sound like a very friendly social place, with both men and women. Also, the articles made the point that these bars did not break any law. But still, the fear of homosexuals was very much present. It was in this climate of fear in 1964 that the Broward School Board hired Dwayne Barker. Originally, Barker was the county juvenile officer in Dade County. He arrested L. Parsons back in 1960. He then began working with the Johns Committee as an investigator. He was one of the authors of the committee's infamous report. Officially, the primary focus of his job was checking the credentials of prospective teachers. But it soon became apparent that Barker's targeted suspected homosexuals. Quote, Effeminate applicants, he said, are going to be turned down, whether they're proven to be homosexual or not, even if they're straight. If they act effeminate, kids will brand them as queer by the end of the first week. In order to ensure that students would report, quote, effeminate teachers, Barker went and spoke at PTA meetings and women's groups. He spoke about the dangers of homosexual teachers and how parents should teach their children to be on the lookout for them. Barker didn't want to be perceived as conducting a witch hunt against homosexuals. The whole thing was done very quietly. When he got information about somebody, suspected of being a homosexual, he would call them in and say, I got this information about you. And typically the teacher would resign and move on. At the end, around 119 teachers quit, rather than being confronted with some kind of accusation that they were homosexuals. His talks before the PTA groups had its effect. Soon, they began to push and organize a major campaign against homosexuals. One of their goals was to shut down bars catering to homosexuals. Also at that time, there was a sitting grand jury investigating organized crime and vice in the county. The PTA and others began to pressure the state's attorney, saying that the grand jury should start investigating homosexuals. 
A few words about how a grand jury works. A grand jury is organized by the state's attorney, and it has 12 members. Its purpose is to investigate suspected criminal activity. One of the key things about a grand jury is that the testimony is secret. At the end of the investigation, the jury issues a report about whether someone should be indicted and brought to trial, or what are the kinds of actions they recommend should be taken. At this time, there were a small number of clubs and bars serving homosexuals in Broward. A popular club was Val's in Oakland Park on North Andrews. Shortly after the grand jury announced its investigation of homosexuals in the county, county sheriff deputies and Oakland Park police ra raided the club. There were about a hundred people in the club, and the police came in and lined everybody up, took their names, addresses, and occupations, and also their license plate numbers. However, only four people were arrested on very minor charges, like vagrancy. Also, the press was alerted. One of the people caught in the raid tried to escape and then ended up kicking the news cameraman in the process. The owner of the club filed a harassment suit against the Broward Sheriff and the Oakland Police. The police continued to come every night and take pictures of the car licenses in the parking lot. Also, a cross was burned in front of the club. At the time, there was a lot of activity in Broward County by the Ku Klux Klan who often lent their support to the police for this kind of activity. However, because of the ongoing harassment by the police, within a month, the bar was closed. The grand jury continued its investigations of homosexuals. Also, the PTA continued its campaign, inviting Barker to come and speak at their meetings. In speaking at these meetings, Barker told the parents that homosexuality was a disease that could not be cured. Many homosexuals, when they were young boys, were seduced by older homosexuals. Homosexuals were trying to deliberately infect young boys. He said that there was a difference between sexual molestation, that is a man molesting a young girl, and homosexual seduction. Sexual molestation was less serious. A young girl could get over it. However, once a young boy was seduced by a homosexual, it was permanent. This was the kind of picture being painted about the danger of homosexuals in Broward County. Early in spring 1967, the grand jury released its report on homosexuality. They recommended a number of actions, like publicizing the threat of homosexuals, a moral squad being created, and that police officials be educated about how to recognize homosexuals and the threat they posed. The state attorney issued a list of a number of bars that they were going to be watched, with police cars staying outside and taking down the license plate numbers. But the problem was that there was not much police could do if they found a homosexual. The sheriff called the attorney general's office up in Tallahassee, asking for some kind of direction and advice on this. And the Attorney General's assistant basically said, quote, A fag can't be arrested just because he's in a bar having a drink. And the police just couldn't close these clubs down. It was finally being recognized that there was a limit to how far they could go in their campaign against homosexuals. Also that spring, a new state's attorney took office, Roger Harper. He was one of the first Republicans elected here. He promised a change in the direction of the grand jury investigation. The different direction, again, was to go after homosexuals. And so he started a new grand jury with a focus on homosexuality. Now, he looked at other crimes like gambling, liquor, and possible police corruption. But homosexuality was his top priority. He hired as an investigator Frank Pinter, who initially worked as a volunteer. Pinter, like Barker, went and spoke before PTA groups. He told one group, quote, Homosexualism is here, and it's big. It's like a cancer, the way it spreads. He argued that the police didn't know enough about homosexuals and the threat they posed. 
One of the things that the grand jury report recommended was that police officials be educated about homosexuality. Harper set up these anti-homo classes for police officials. Barker and Pinter were in charge. They would show police officials what they should be looking for, using copies of homosexual magazines and publications. It was not clear how much the police learned that they did not already know. Again, newspaper reporters went to gay bars, and again found that they were really quite friendly and sociable. They did not seem to pose any kind of big threat. It was really very difficult to determine who was a homosexual or a deviant. And if you found one, there really wasn't much you can do about it, because supposedly there's no cure. And even if the homosexual wanted to be cured, there were no facilities available. This campaign and investigation was going on for a couple months till mid-1967, when Harper put a hold on it, saying that the local politicians were creating problems for him. But basically, through this campaign against homosexuals, he was showing himself to be something of a loose cannon on the Broward political scene. At one point during spring break, then a very important tourist event for Fort Lauderdale, he spoke before a civic group and lashed out against the whole spring break crowd, calling them a group of cruds and lushes. There was a move among Broward officials to get him dumped. Also a big problem was his special investigator, Frank Pinter, who was suspected of being involved in a number of criminal activities. Also, at various points, Harper would invite Pinter into the grand jury investigation room during the giving of testimony, which was a big violation of grand jury rules and compromised any action by the grand jury. In the late summer, he was suspended by the governor for malfeasance. The stated reason was allowing Pinter into the grand jury and compromising jury secrecy. But in reality, there are many other kinds of complaints against him. After his suspension, After his suspension, it came out that Harper, a married man with ten children, had a mistress. He kept her in an apartment in Pompano and used money from his state's attorney office to pay her rent. He was also facing jail for contempt in allowing Pinter into the grand jury room. After he was suspended, his replacement, Ron Clark, who was appointed by the governor, gave a major speech about the problems facing Broward County and the state's attorney's office. He painted a very dark picture of vice and dope, but there was no mention about the threat of homosexuals. What happened to Barker? Well, Barker still continued his investigation of teachers. But now the Classroom Teachers Association the teachers' union, began to raise the question of due process. If Parker had a complaint, why was there not an official accusation and process instead of forcing teachers to quietly resign? Then there were other questions about his methods, like asking students to admit on a questionnaire their illegal drug use. In 1968, he was demoted from his position as head of school security. As an employee of the school board, they couldn't easily fire him, but they hired a retired FBI agent to replace him. It was obvious that he had become a very big problem for the school board. Also, remembering his earlier comments about homosexuality being worse than sexual molestation, that year his 22-year-old son was arrested for sexually molesting a 13-year-old girl. In many ways after this, any attempt to organize a campaign against homosexuals in Broward had very little credibility and wouldn't go very far. Moving into the 1970s, we are entering into a very different cultural and political landscape. This was a very, very tumultuous time 
in terms of sexual standards and in terms of politics. He began to see a major shift in the kind of overall culture. For example, here's a story that appeared in the New York Times Magazine in the mid-1960s. It was about homosexuals. But it took the whole issue of homosexuality, and rather than viewing it as a deviance or sickness, placed it in the frame of civil rights, that homosexuals were another minority. In the context of the civil rights movement which dominated the media at that time, this was a new understanding of who homosexuals were and what they wanted. Much in the same way that segregation laws were unjust, laws criminalizing homosexuality were equally unjust and needed to be changed. Also, there was a larger cultural change. In places like New York and San Francisco, there were large, visible gay and lesbian communities. Also, you had Stonewall. The one-year anniversary of Stonewall was celebrated with a peaceful rally at Central Park. It also made the front page of the New York Times. Also, in 1970, you had the first gay pride march in Miami. In 1972, Republicans held their national convention in Miami. This was accompanied by numerous protests. The protesters, Cubans, anti-war protesters, and gays camped out in Flamingo Park in Miami Beach during the convention. They protested the renomination of Richard Nixon. Lesbians and gay men arrived from all parts of the country to protest. This was the first national gay action. Also that year, again in Miami Beach, was a Democratic convention. But rather than protesting, gays and lesbians were a part of that convention, and a gay man was nominated for vice president. In cities across America, lesbians and gay men were getting involved in politics. In Detroit in 1974, when the city was rewriting the city charter, local lesbians and gay activists asked that sexual orientation be added to the protected classes. With little controversy, it was. Very importantly, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association changed its position about the mental illness status of homosexuality. Up to that point in time, it was easy for newspapers and others to say that homosexuality was a mental illness. Now they could not do that anymore. But more importantly for most Americans was not what the American Psychiatric Association said, but what Dear Abby said. In a letter to Dear Abby in the early 1970s, a woman complained about her new neighbors, a younger and older man who had all sorts of strange people visiting them, men who looked like women, women who looked like men, blacks, whites, Indians, and even two nuns going into their house. She was afraid that something strange was going on. She called the police, but they couldn't do anything. So she asked Anne, what can I do? Anne's response, you could move. So in the early 1970s, people began to accept that homosexuals were a part of the cultural and social landscape. Here in Fort Lauderdale, a major tourist town, gays were becoming more and more visible. Local newspapers began to run stories about their presence. It's interesting to note that in the pictures, you do not see their faces, or they are depicted graphically. Also very important at that time were the gay bar guides, which showed where the gay bars were, and in Fort Lauderdale, there were a fairly good number of them. One place in particular was the Marlin Beach Hotel on A1A, today where Beach Place is. The Marlin Beach Hotel was built in 1950 as a large luxury hotel. It had an underground tunnel between the hotel and the beach, so rather walk across A1A, people could walk underneath it. There was one bar on the lower level with windows opening onto the large patio pool, and guests could sit at the bar and watch people swimming in the pool. However, in the 1960s, beachfront businesses were being hit with the same kind of problems other businesses had in central Fort Lauderdale. In 
1970, it was bought by Bill Hoven, who also built a Venetian at the end of Las Olas. Hoven hired a young gay man from Chicago, John Costelli, to run the ho hotel and restaurant. He really had no experience in running a hotel or bar, but as a gay man, he was familiar with the gay resort businesses that were appearing then on Fire Island and in Provincetown. He realized that the Marlin Beach would be a great gay winter resort business. He painted the hotel pink and advertised extensively in the Northeast. Posting ads for local help, he noted, quote, a happy attitude and heavy muscle was required. Wanting to attract a local lesbian and gay crowd, he went to the gay beach, which at that time was in Dania, along with the nude beach. It was secluded and had a lot of bushes where gay men would go there and hook up. However, the county police watched the area and made many arrests. Castelli posted flyers all around Dania Beach inviting everyone to come to the Sunday tea dances and to the beach in front of the Marlin. Both the gay beach and the Sunday tea dances Both the gay beach and the Sunday tea dance around the hotel's large patio pool became a popular site for the city's growing lesbian and gay community. Also burnishing Fort Lauderdale's image as a gay tourist center were gay cruises. The first all-gay cruise for the Caribbean left Fort Lauderdale in December 1974. Aboard were over 300 gay men, all young, white, well-heeled, mostly from New York, California, and Florida, and mostly in the closet. Many feared that with so many gay men together, they were in for a week of bitchery, pretensions, and bad manners. In addition to the daytime pool stunning, the cruise featured a leather fashion show, a nightly celebration of upcoming 1975 holidays like Halloween and Valentine's Day, an all-night disco, and at the end of the cruise, the passengers elected from their numbers a cruise king, who was a popular but closeted soap opera star. Many were amazed that instead of the bitchery and pretensions, the week-long cruise passed in a warm spirit of moderation and mutual respect. Also in the 1970s, other gay bars and clubs began to open. They often offered entertainment. A very popular club was the Copa, which opened in 1975. They had big-name entertainment, such as a disco star, Sylvester, and the popular drag queen, Divine. Bars and clubs were becoming a very important spaces where lesbian and gay men could go and express themselves. However, there were other ways and spaces to express a lesbian and gay identity. One was the motorcycle club, like the Thebans. In contrast to female impersonators and the very effeminate type of atmosphere that you often found in gay bars, motorcycle clubs and motorcycle bars were very masculine and they were forerunners of the leather bars today. Also important at that time was the development of the Metropolitan Community Church, which opened in Fort Lauderdale in the mid-1970s. This provided another kind of space for homosexual people to go and feel comfortable and express themselves as being homosexuals in a religious setting instead of a bar setting. Another area of activity in space were the student groups at Florida Atlantic University and at that time Broward Community College, now Broward College. It was very common across the country on college campuses for lesbian and gay students to organize and form groups. They brought in speakers. They also did social events such as a cabaret night fundraiser. Also, they would get involved in political efforts. Here, the student group at Florida Atlantic University is protesting the harassment of gay men on the Boca Raton Beach. However, the campaigns against homosexuals that were a prominent part of 1960s politics had not entirely disappeared. In 1976, Fort Lauderdale elected a new mayor, Clay Shaw, a Republican. One of his goals was to revitalize the breach and bring in more tourist business. But when he saw the Marlin Beach, the big gay hotel, and the crowds it attracted, he thought it was a disgrace to the city. 
and that the whole idea of gay tourism was appalling. It would ruin any attempt to bring in the kind of respectable tourist trade, like families, he wanted to attract. Claiming that the Marlin Beach was a center of prostitution and drug dealing, he began a campaign to close down the hotel. Like other politicians before him, he called for a grand jury to investigate and bring charges against the hotel. Now, if this would have happened ten years earlier, a grand jury would be created and an investigation would begin. But this was the 1970s. The gay and lesbian community had become visible, active, and organized. They were aware of their position in society. The community fought back. The hotel denied the charges of prostitution, saying that they ran a very respectable business. But beyond that, they argued that their business, gay tourism, contributed to the city's financial health. For the first time, gay and lesbians were standing up and saying, no, we're not some kind of marginal group you can ignore. We actually are an asset. But beyond this, lesbians and gay men began to protest the mayor's attack and began to organize and call for his apology or resignation. They held a rally in front of the mayor's office. This was the first time you saw the community standing up and fighting back. Police officials rejected the mayor's call for a grand jury, saying that there was no cause for an investigation. Also, the mayor's actions were generating bad publicity for the city. Finally, the Fort Lauderdale News stepped in and reprimanded the mayor, saying that what he was doing was giving the city a very bad image. He should stop. Shaw stopped, and the Marlin Beach went on to become more popular than ever. The attack by the mayor, and then the Anita Bryant campaign in Miami, caused the queer community in Broward to become more politically aware and active. Two important groups were formed. One group was the Tuesday Night Group, meeting monthly on a Tuesday night. It wasn't political in the sense of being partisan or a protest group or whatever. It was first a social group that was very popular. It provided another space and opportunity for lesbians and gay men to come together. But it also took on a number of political functions. For example, it would conduct candidate forums before elections. Also, it sponsored forums with the city police to develop a dialogue between the gay community and the police. A more explicit political group was the Broward Coalition for Human Rights. It was organized against Shaw's Marlin Beach campaign. It also organized against the Nina Bryan campaign in Miami. In contrast to the Tuesday night group, members of the coalition were out of the closet and very open about their sexuality. In 1980, Broward activists joined with Dade County activists to get six openly gay and lesbian delegates and alternates elected to the Democratic National Convention. Their success created a very important kind of political visibility. Also in the late 1970s and early 1980s, you had even more bars and clubs opening up. There was a very active bar scene, with bars and clubs appealing to all segments of the community, both men and women. Also a very active place was the Club Bathhouse. It was run by Jack Campbell, who was a very important community figure. He donated large amounts of money to both local and national gay and lesbian causes. We think of bathhouses today as being very sleazy, some place you don't want to go. But back then, it was a very big social hub. They would actually invite candidates to come and speak to the people there. In early 1982, the Miami Herald ran a series about the gay community in Broward County. It described how here there was a gay mecca. Lesbian and gay people were not marginal anymore. Their presence was very strong and powerful. It noted how gay businesses were an important part of the county's economy. Lesbians and gay men were buying some of the rundown houses in central Broward and fixing them up, establishing vibrant neighborhoods. One of the first gay neighborhoods was Riverside. 
More lesbian and gay men were moving to Fort Lauderdale and finding a new and satisfying life here. So this was 1982, and you can see the kind of presence that the lesbian gay community had here. It was seen as being very powerful, very active, very alive, very vibrant. And in many ways, this was a high point. Later that year, the local gay newspaper printed an article about a strange new pneumonia that had stricken a number of gay men. This was one of the first reports of what became known as the AIDS epidemic. Soon, there would be many other reports. Up till now, the story of the LGBT community, both in Fort Lauderdale and in America, has been a story of moving from invisibility into visibility, moving from being a presence to becoming a community. Facing many challenges, defeats, but always emerging stronger, winning not only a measure of tolerance, but of respect. But now the story will be very different. Thank you.